you have to value yourself as an important employee in your business. And I know in the beginning we're like, oh, we're just not going to pay ourselves because we want the business to thrive. But if you can't thrive, the business can't thrive. If you don't have money, the business isn't going to be successful. Exactly. I'm Amy Porterfield, ex-corporate girl turned CEO of a multi seven-figure business. But it wasn't all that long ago that I lacked the confidence, the budget, and the time to focus on growing my small but mighty business. Fast forward past many failed attempts and lessons learned, and you'll see the business I have today. One that changes lives and gives me more freedom than I ever thought possible. One that used to only exist as a daydream. I created the Online Marketing Made Easy podcast to give you simple, actionable, step-by-step -step strategies to help you do the same. If you're an ambitious entrepreneur or one in the making who's looking to create a business that makes an impact and a life you love, you're in the right place, friend. Let's get started. Well, hey there, friend. Welcome to this bonus episode of Online Marketing Made Easy. Today, we've got a very special guest on the show, someone who's no stranger to the world of finance and personal development. I'm thrilled to welcome Farnoosh Tarabi to the podcast. Earlier this year, I had the privilege of being a guest on her podcast, which is called So Money. And it's always such a pleasure connecting with someone who shares a passion for helping others live their richest, happiest lives. Farnoosh is, without a doubt, one of America's leading personal finance authorities. She's a multi-best-selling financial author and a former CNBC host, so you know we're in for some top-notch insights and advice. The New York Times even calls her advice perfectly practical, which if you know me, you know that's my favorite way to teach. And as I mentioned, she is the host of the award-winning and critically acclaimed podcast, So Money!, which has surpassed a whopping 30 million downloads. She's interviewed an incredible array of experts, authors, and influencers, including Ariana Huffington and Queen Latifah. What? What's truly inspiring about Farnoosh is her background. She was born to immigrant parents who arrived in the U.S. with just two suitcases and a dream of building their American dream. Her upbringing instilled values of patience, generosity, and hard work, and it's the foundation that drives her mission to help others achieve financial greatness. On today's episode, we'll be diving into various financial topics and people's relationships with money. What I love most about this episode is we got into things like the mindset that doesn't support us in making a lot of money. We talk about the reason why both Farnoosh and why I talk so much about making money, like why that's important to us. I'm going to share one of the things that have kept me back from actually easily making money. And that was something that my dad taught me very young that actually did not support me into my adulthood. So I'll be sharing a little personal background to my money values as well. So this is a really great episode that not only will help you with your personal finances, but with your business finances as well. Also, she has a brand new book that just came out that we're going to talk about and I highly recommend. So stay tuned, grab a notebook, join us as we embark on a journey with Farnoosh to learn how to conquer our fears, make smart financial decisions, and live our richest, happiest lives. It's going to be a fantastic episode. Let's get into it. Welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you here, Farnoosh. Thanks for being here. Oh, it's my honor, Amy. Thank you for inviting me. I've been looking forward to this because here's the thing. You've had an incredible career in personal finance. And I was curious, can you share what initially sparked your interest to work in this field? Hmm. Oh, well, yeah, because it was my dream, right? When you're a, a little girl, it's like someday I hope to work in personal finance journalism. <laughs> it, it's, you know, it's interesting. I think that the truth of it is, is there's two parallel stories that basically led me to where I am today. The first is when I was young, I was a little girl growing up in a household that talked about money quite frequently. My parents are from the Middle East and 
our culture is much more open to discussing money than I think other cultures. And um, I didn't recognize the the benefits of that growing up necessarily, or that that this this was like even something different growing up. And I think that early access to money conversations, that fluency set a really strong foundation for me so that when I became uh, a young adult, it wasn't this taboo topic for me. And then in addition to that, I was somebody who, when I thought about what I wanted to do for my career, I wanted to be in service. I wanted to be helpful. I loved storytelling. And although I majored in finance, there was a a plot twist where I then went to journalism school to get my master's and combine my background in money and finance with the storytelling and the journalism. And so right away in my early 20s, I started working in personal finance as a reporter and it just stuck. It it wasn't a a long-term plan necessarily. I just thought this is my in into the world of media and we'll see where things take me. If I had a choice, maybe I would have immediately picked something like, I don't know. Actually, I thought I wanted to be a war reporter, which oh. um, my parents convinced me against seeing this, though. You know, they were very uh, aware of, of what a war is like. They came from Iran during the 1970s revolution. So they were like, please don't do that. Um, your job at Money Magazine offers dental. We think you should stay. And boots on the ground. I said, okay, fine. And honestly, I just so much enjoyed talking about money. People need this information so, so badly. There at the time wasn't a lot of information tailored to people who were in my demographic, a young person, a woman. And now, of course, we see all the flavors of financial advice online. And that's so wonderful. And it's really a testament to how far we've come with this industry. But back in the early 2000s, it was like, you know, really just catered to the retired white man. Yep. And and I wanted to add more voices to that to that world. And thank goodness you did. So if someone were to come up to you at a cocktail party and say, what do you do? What do you <laughs> tell people? Um, I like to unlock financial freedom for people. You know, I, I have I wear many hats, so I, I don't want to bore someone with the list of all my income streams, but But we are curious on this podcast. We like to know how people make money. So oh, sure. I'll bring it down for you. So I suppose uh, my income pie is part writing and I'm an author, obviously. So that's generates income. Uh, I do brand partnerships. So I work sometimes with brands to be a financial ambassador to help educate people through their resources and their platform. I work in television occasionally. I get paid to host events or host television programs. I have a background in broadcast journalism, so that's where that shows up sometimes in my life today. I coach individuals and groups the behind the scenes of my business, not so much personal finance, but if you're interested in learning how to build a sustainable, personality-driven, thought leadership business like I have for over 15 years, come with me. I'll show you all the behind the scenes, what I do, what I don't do, the people I trust, the resources I tap. And that's been a lot of fun. And I have obviously a podcast. (laughs) I forget about that sometimes. It's been nine years. It's called So Money. And that generates revenue through advertising and partnerships. And I, I actually think the podcast for me over the last nine years has been the flywheel of content and also the magnet for a lot of the other work that I attract, whether it's the coaching business, the partnerships with the brands. It kind of starts with their curiosity and interest and their impression of the podcast, and then it kind of goes from there. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. I love that you set the scene for us. I want to go back to your parents, and I've heard you say that your parents instilled virtues of patience and generosity and hard work in you, and they were a really big influence. So How did these values influence your approach to personal finance and also that mission you mentioned to help others with their financial well-being? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my parents really encouraged me to pursue life in a very self-aligned way. And I think when it comes to personal finance, for a long time, the education around it was strictly focus on the finances, focus on the numbers. It's black or white. Don't it, you know, it shouldn't be emotional. But I think the truth of it is, how can it not be emotional? Money is personal to us. It's a limited resource and therefore evokes a lot of things like fear and anxiety and stress. And I think that 
when we started to have more of this conversation, I like to think that I was kind of at the forefront of this back in the day, we started to sort of adjust this way that we were thinking about personal finance to say, hey, you know, this is an area in our lives that deserves a lot of personal direction and thought and self-alignment. And while rules of thumb are great, and yes, there are benchmarks we want to hit in general when it comes to saving and investing, and we don't obviously want to be in credit card debt for the rest of our lives, but Beyond that, how you manage your money should reflect your values, you know, all the goals that you have, your personality even. And so once we started to shift that mindset around, well, hey, wait a minute, personal finance is personal, I think it started to actually interest more people. Because when you're talking about money, as I say, you're often talking about life, you're talking about your family, your upbringing, your narrative, your goals. And that is actually more interesting to people than the dollars and cents of it. And if I'm if I'm on this mission to get everybody educated about money, which I'll be the first to admit is not, it's not the sexiest topic. It's not the most exciting for most people. I, I think we have to find better ways in. And I think these are the better ways in to start, first start talking about your story, who you are, what you're passionate about, and then showing, hey, this is how you can mirror that in your financial life and direct your dollars in more personally aligned, personally fulfilling ways. Mm, Amen to that. So the New York Times has referred to your financial advice as, I love this, perfectly practical. And you've been featured in countless top ranking national media outlets in the country. So why do you think that your financial advice resonates so well with people? And how do you think your message is different from others? And the reason I ask this is there's a lot of people listening right now. They're growing their businesses. They're trying to cut through the noise online to be seen and heard. And so essentially, what advice for entrepreneurs do you have on how to stand out in a seemingly saturated industry, especially one like money? Well, I think it goes back to my roots in journalism. I started this course with pursuing the truth. You know, that's the bottom line for me. And and along the way, showing how I'm doing things and bringing in the stories and making it colorful. But I like to think that my differentiation in the marketplace is that I am a truth-seeking journalist and I am very insistent upon facts. And listen, I almost got fired my first job because I was a poor fact checker. So I think that trauma has lasted and has has stuck around. I I believe that people deserve to know the truth and the transparency of it all. And so I think that there's a lot of shiny objects and stories out there about how people may have went from zero to seven figures and or started a business seemingly overnight or got out of debt in three months which might be true, but I want to know the in-between parts. And I think that's where I shine. I sort of show people the journey. And you know, I'm not one of those financial experts that's telling you necessarily how I spend every penny of my life, but I don't think that discredits me. I think that you know I'm just somebody who is here to show you perhaps how others are doing it. I'm the storyteller. I'm the truth seeker. And I'll tell you, that has really benefited me and served me when people are looking to hire the authority in this market, Yeah, right? Trust goes a long way. The facts go a long way. And so if you are somebody who is trying to mark your mark in in your industry, in your thought leadership world, um, bringing in science, bringing in data, bringing in real stories that you have fact-checked can really set you apart in a world where there's so much misinformation and so much lack of information that this is your opportunity to really differentiate and in such an important way. Yes, that's really valuable. I think no matter what industry you're in, you are right that that will set you apart because people are slinging information left or right and right online and on social media. And you're like, really? Is that really true? And so I love that you get down to the truth. I think that does make you different. And those listening, that can make you different as well when you approach the data differently. Now, you talk a lot about financial independence, financial freedom. I talk, one of the reasons I do what I do is I want people to have freedom on their terms, whatever that looks like. So freedom is a big part of our brand as well. So I'm curious for you, how do you define financial independence or financial freedom? Well, obviously you gotta have finance in that in that equation, you have to have money. But beyond that, and I would say 
as important as money, if not more important, is time and health. I think the variables to financial freedom ultimately is that combination of money, time, and health. All these resources that sometimes we underestimate because we're so focused on how much we have in the bank account, when of course that's important, but what is that if you don't have your health? What is that if you're burnt out and you have you lack time to spend time with your family, to care for yourself, to care for your community? So as I get older too, I'm okay with making less if it means I can unlock other resources in my life, like my time, and have more time for tending to myself and to my two growing kids. And so I was just talking to actually Kelly Ripa. Uh, I think she'll be okay if I tell you this story. She's been a great, well, she wrote the blurb for the book and I've been on her show many times. And she says to me, you know, as I negotiate my contracts every however often, I'm asking more time back. I want more time off. Her kids were getting older and are older and they're she's empty nesting now. And I think she's realizing that, you know, once you make a certain amount of money, I think she's reached her enough. And now it's like, what else do I value? And obviously it's my time and it's getting my time back. Maybe the time that she didn't have when she was building her career. And I said to her, well, that's the true definition of wealth. When you can afford to fight for that and, and valuing that is um, something that we sometimes forget is important. And she sort of said this to me in a way that was like, maybe this is unusual, you know, but I said, no, that's, that's on the money. Ooh, I love that. It's so interesting because I just had a conversation with my CEO and my executive assistant. No decisions have been made, but we work a four day work week. But I am curious what it would look like if I personally also took off Monday and had a three-day work week. I think you'd like it. <laughs> right? Could I get the work done and could, uh, how would I spend my time wisely so I feel free in that? And so uh, I love that Kelly Ripp is starting to think of the same thing. Like, you know, money's great, but also spending your time how you want to spend it is pretty valuable as well. Because I, and and I do think it's special. I don't think everybody has that mindset. I think that we live in an extremely hustle oriented culture where you're only as good as your last revenue year. Yep. And if you're making less than 2022, well, you're doing something wrong. You're not as successful. And I think that you have to look at the totality of your resources and maybe your, maybe your revenue went down, but your time allocation went up. Maybe your health is better. These are not little things. And I, I think it's, obviously something that we can appreciate more as we get older. And I think when you're young, look, I was the person who was burning the midnight oil and all hours working, hustling 17 different jobs. And I wouldn't necessarily go back and do anything differently. But it's one of the benefits of, I think, once you've sort of reached enough, realizing, okay, here's where I want to emphasize my time. Here's how I want to, here's what I want to really earn at the end of the day, not just money, but other things. Yes. Amen to that. I love that. Okay. So one of the benefits of having you on the show is that I do want to talk about financial habits and practices. So I'm curious, what are like three to five key financial habits and practices that you believe everyone, no matter the size of their bank account, Mm -hmm. can and should incorporate into their daily lives just to build a strong financial foundation? Well, firstly, I think if you're earning money, the very first thing everybody would want to do, should do, because you matter, is to save an automatic 10, 15% of your earnings in a liquid savings account. It can be a high yield savings account, which right now would be great because you're earning five, 6% on your dollar, but anywhere is fine. The important thing is that it's liquid, which means that it's accessible to you in the event that you lose your job or you quit your job and you need access to money to help you pay your bills and keep the lights on. And I would say do that until you have about a six month reserve and six months meaning six months of your expenses. So take your full month's worth of expenses, multiply that by six. That's what you want to kind of shoot for with this practice. Got it. Okay. Okay. Secondly, I would say automate. So not just the savings, but your debt payoff, your investing strategy. The more you can automate your financial life, which means that you are not writing checks, you're not um, transferring money over the phone, you're literally like at rest, you're sleeping and your money is moving to where it needs to go. This we know behaviorally 
it works perfectly because as humans, we cannot be held accountable for these sorts of decisions. Life is busy. We don't like to do it. We forget to do it. But when you automate, your savings potential increases, your investing potential increases. So hooking up, let's say, your bank account to your different uh, billers and payers and accounts is a wonderful way to ensure you stay on track financially. Oh, I love that. And then the other thing I would say is just look at your numbers, not obsessively, not every day, but monthly or quarterly. And what numbers am I talking about? I would look at your spending and just, first of all, make sure everything is correct because sometimes there are mistakes. Credit card companies, retailers can double charge you. You may have returned something it hasn't processed. And I think it's important to just, you know, be in the habit of of knowing what your habits are as you spend and and that it's okay to adjust as you go along. You may have signed up for a subscription at the beginning of the year. You don't need it anymore. These are the sorts of things you want to catch because the little things really do add up. Um, and again, not to get obsessive, but it's good habits. I mean, I, I'm not somebody who gets on a scale anymore <laughs> every day, but you know the benefits of knowing where you're at yes. uh, numbers wise in your personal health and also in your personal finances. And I would add one a fourth thing to this list of good behaviors is find a money buddy, somebody that you can talk to about money. Maybe it's your partner. Maybe it's a girlfriend. Maybe it's someone you don't know, but you follow online because they have a great, robust, engaging online community where you feel like you can learn and share. I think it's important to give yourself that access so that you're not feeling as though you're going it alone. And as I say on my podcast, we're all experts in personal finance because we're living, breathing creatures that are making money, spending money, losing money, investing money. We've all made mistakes. Yeah. We've all had wins. So tapping your your neighbor, your immediate resources is always helpful. Oh, amen to that. Having someone that you could keep you accountable and check in with, I think would be so valuable. We talk about that in business all the time, but why not do it in your finances as well? Um, I have a few girlfriends that are in the industry like me, and we talk about money all the time. I love what you said earlier that your family, it was very normal to talk money. And I love to talk about money. I love to talk about how much we make, what our expenses are, our profits. I try to do that with my students a lot to get them very comfortable with talking about money and not thinking that it's something that should be so private that you can't even get advice from what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting to know how my friends and peers manage their money and what they do. So I was thinking from a business standpoint, especially because you have your own business, you work with people building brands. So what are some business financial tips or strategies that you can share? Because a lot of my students just starting out, they're like, whoa, I don't even know what to do. Like they have a personal checking account. They start running their business from that. So I think one of the first things is they know not to do that. But what would you say to someone who's maybe one or two years into building their business? Well, treat your business with its own set of organs and you know you have your personal finances over here which we know at, hopefully at this point you shouldn't be using your personal checking to cover business expenses but beyond that what are the other instruments and other organs that your business needs to thrive that are great financial instruments in addition to your business checking and savings but also a business credit card and also an investment account so as an LLC or an S Corp, you can have a solo 401k or a SEP IRA, which is essentially a retirement account set up within the domain of your business. And you can usually invest multiple times more in these types of accounts than a personal retirement account. So taking advantage of that, it's a great tax write-off and it's a great way to sort of supplement your retirement and speed through your retirement because you can, I think, save, I think this year, in a SEP IRA, it's over sixty thousand dollars. So if you wanted to go all that all that way, you could. Yeah, I think it's important to have a board of advisors, and this can be a tax person, but it can also be, to your point, other people in your industry that you are regularly checking in with. Maybe it's your mastermind, maybe it's your coach, but having somebody that keeps you accountable and keeps you informed is so important. Just seeing your business as really just separate from your personal life is really important. But also remember to pay yourself, paying yourself first. Uh, I, I know there's this great book called Profit First, this idea that just like you have to 
value yourself as an important employee in your business. I know in the beginning we're like, oh, we're just not going to pay ourselves because we want the business to thrive. But if you can't thrive, the business can't thrive. If you don't have money, the business isn't going to be successful. Exactly. I would also say to have a much bigger savings account than somebody that has a corporate nine to five job. I think it's important for entrepreneurs to have about a one year savings runway because, I mean, I look at myself, every year is different in my business in terms of where the bigger money is coming from. Some years it's brand partnerships, some years it's the podcast, some years it's the coaching. And to ramp that up, to get those contracts, it takes time. It's not going to take a year, but I'm a little bit more conservative. I like to have at least a year because also there are external influences. Like there could be a recession. There could be a stock market crash. There could be who knows what. Uh, and and you have to just prepare for that. You want to be able to give your business its best shot and to have just a one month savings account for your business. I mean, we saw what happened during the pandemic. So many businesses collapsed because they couldn't even make payroll without one month of revenue. And you never want to be in that kind of a vulnerable position. I think we say six months for personal savings. I think you want to multiply that by two for your business. Ooh, I love that. Yes to that. Also, I love your take on fear and I want my listeners to hear this, but you've said that you've never accomplished anything of importance by completely ignoring your fears. So can you elaborate on the idea of fearlessness and why mm -hmm. you think it's a terrible trend and give us a piece of advice so that as it relates to finances. Happy to. Well, this brings us to my new book, A Healthy State of Panic. And as you said, Amy, I've never been the person who could just go out in life and be fearless because the way that fearlessness works is that it doesn't. And I think that when we tell people to just be fearless, to just do this thing without fear, what are we essentially telling people to do? Don't assume for risk don't care about what the outcome will be, deal with it later. I have never been someone, and I would venture to guess most of us, cannot afford to walk through life with such carelessness. And so, yes, fear in our culture has gotten a very bad rap. It's this four-letter word. When it shows up in our bodies, when we hear the word, we instantly think that this is a sign of weakness. But my offer, and what I talk about in the book, is that what if we look at fear as just like any other emotion that shows up in your body that has a message to share with you about what it is you want to protect, what your goals are? I think that when fear, and this is my advice, when fear shows up in your life, in your business, at the crossroads of making a really big decision, whether it's should I start the business, shut down the business, should I grow the business? Or in your personal life, should I get married, not get married, have kids, not have kids? I think that if you're afraid, you want to sit with that fear, not because you want to drown in it, but because you want to face it and ask it some important questions. And I have all the questions in the book, but I would start with something like, what do you want me to protect here? What is it that I need to keep an eye out for? Should I review something before I go do this thing? Do I need to get more educated? Because that's what really fear in these high stakes moments is really nudging us towards. The book isn't about how to get over your fear of flying or the fear of spiders, but it's how to get over, or rather not get over, but how to sort of dance with the fears that show up in our lives that deal with things like heavy things like loneliness and rejection and failure. And for me in my life, I didn't always have this protocol. I didn't know that I could actually face my fear and collaborate with it as opposed to combat it. And so in the beginning of my career, I would really run into some dead ends, suffer from major imposter syndrome. I almost got fired. I had a really bad experience dating. So it wasn't until I realized like fear is not going to go away just because I tell it to, just because I ignore it. Better to look at fear and see it as a valid emotional response. I think we're over this whole pursuit of happiness 24 seven. It just doesn't feel genuine to the human experience. And there was actually a study this year across multiple educational academic institutions that found that people who look at sort of these bad emotions, and I use air quotes, like fear, anger, and sadness as 
weakness and they have a negative reaction to these words, they are not as happy as people who look at these words and they go, huh, okay, I'm either neutral on this or they take it a step further like me and they go, I think there's an opportunity here to explore why I'm sad, why I'm afraid, why I'm angry. And I think at the end of the day, why this is true is because if I'm a happy person, most of the most times, <laughs> most, look, I, have, I have my moments, but I think generally I feel like I've, I feel very fulfilled and I have a happy life, but it's because I am in touch with all my emotions. I'm aware of myself. I am aware of what I care about. And that awareness is born out of having a connection to how I feel and not dismissing my emotions. And I think that we're just ready for this. You know, I think we're ready. There's so many books um, similar to mine that are flipping emotion scripts. There's a great book called, for example, The Power of Regret by Daniel Pink. And then there was a great book that I read years ago because I was going through a lot of stress called The Upside of Stress. And so, hey, let's like maybe think about these emotions that have given us so much agita and that we've seen as just this arch nemesis that maybe there is some good in it. Because to be honest, Amy, you and I would not be here. And those of you listening, we would not be here had it not been for fear. Fear has helped us and protected us for generations. Absolutely true. Oh, I love that you say that. And uh, I've had Brooke Castillo on the show a few times and on her podcast, she talks a lot about you're not supposed to be happy every single minute of your life. <laughs> that is not normal. But the first time I heard it, I was like, really? Yeah. And you're not doing life wrong when you're having a moment of sadness, yes. of grief. It means you are living your life beautifully. You are doing what you're... I mean, who didn't see the Barbie movie, right? Right. <laughs> so true. Do you just want to live in a plastic house? No. You want to live in the real world and experience real things. Yes. Yeah, so true. I, I've recently been going through this thing where I feel a little bit stuck. I feel a little bit numb about things. And I can't quite figure it out. And normally I'd beat myself up for your life is wonderful. You should be happy. Things are good. Yeah. And all of that is true. But I'm in my older years, I've been trying to say, it's okay to feel this way. It's just, it's just a moment. It will not be here forever. Two things can be true at the same time. You can be grateful and you can be grieving. Yes. You know, I think the world is a mess right now and we're continuing to work. We're continuing to show up for our families and for ourselves. Does that mean that we are forgetting all of the trauma around us? No, we ha- we, our hearts are big. Our brains are big. Our bodies are capable of being more than just in one play mode. <laughs> yes. You know, like I'm only going to be happy. I'm only going to be sad. I think that's not actually how human beings work. And so if you ever feel guilt or shame around maybe having disappointment in your life when everything seemingly is good and comparatively is better than maybe your friends or your neighbors' lives, I think it's okay because that is part of the human experience. And that's how you actually got to where you are. Like our fears, sometimes we have to thank them because the fear, for example, not having enough, which shows up a lot in our financial lives, often fuels us to go out there and make a life and save and protect our finances. And maybe that fear doesn't always go away. Like there's a hum of it. But I always say like, maybe just recognizing it, you realize like it got you to where you are and you can lay it to rest now, but let's give it some credit, you know, because it's gotten you to where you are. And maybe it's here again because it wants you to take you to the next level. Ooh, very well could be true. So yeah, wishing away all the feelings is not the way to go. So I love, definitely love your stance on fear and embracing it. And like you said, dancing with it. I think it's so important. Now, another thing that you talk about in your book, A Healthy State of Panic, is this personal discovery journey with money and with debt and with finances and with business. So can you elaborate on what this looks like? Like what steps do people need to take to truly understand their beliefs and their relationship with money? Well, I think that everybody has a personal financial narrative. Often on my show, So Money, I talk to guests about what was your earliest money memory growing up because it's not inconsequential. What we experience as young people, all the influences and the messages that we got, particularly around money, even if we got no messages, there's a story there that's going to impact you. Yep. 
it's important to connect these dots, I think, because who you are today as a financial person, as someone who spends a certain way, thinks a certain way about their money, it didn't just show up yesterday. You didn't just sort of inherit it from nowhere. It has a story. And I think when we can get to the origin story of our financial views, we can develop either it's maybe compassion for ourselves. We can develop um, a recognition that, oh my God, this was my mother's way of doing things. It doesn't have to be my way of doing things. Or, hey, I learned, this is these are the lessons I want to take with me. These are the lessons I don't. And especially for couples, I think this is an important exercise because often financial opposites attract, just like opposites attract. And so without this background story understanding, without the context of where your partner is coming from with their financial mindset, you can start to judge, you can get impatient, you lack empathy. But when we can unpack these stories, I think it just makes the bond stronger to one another, but also to your own sort of story and, and what parts that you want to take with you and what parts you want to lay down. So that's the first thing. The second thing is recognizing, you know, I know that in business, we often talk about like the five-year goal, I think, or the, you know, your five-year plan. I think it's too far out to think that abstractly. I think it's important in your financial life to think certainly like to the future, but Sometimes you just need to think about like three months from now, six months from now, a year from now. So what are the shifts that you want to see happen between now and let's say next summer, Q3, Q4, in terms of your debt, in terms of your investing and your earning, giving yourself realistic goals. It makes you feel like you're working towards something and then thinking about why these goals are important to you, not just because as humans, we need a reason to go for the money. It doesn't, I mean, some of us are just hardwired. We like money and we go for it and we like to invest and all that. And I think that's a small subset of humans. I think yeah. most of us, we we need a very compelling personal why. So that's an important thing to craft. Why do I want financial freedom? And for me, I can say it's because I want to have optionality in my life. I want to be able to afford myself choices when life gets a little difficult. So like during the pandemic, having the optionality to move was not something I take for granted and not something that I could just afford overnight. It was something that I had to build towards. But it's because I knew that I'm somebody who errs more on the side of being conservative and I'm going to save my money in that way. I'm going to save more than maybe the average person because I have two kids. I am the breadwinner. I kind of have to, but also I'm maybe it's that fear in me. And then when the pandemic hit, we were able to mobilize quickly because of that, because of our resources. So that was a why that served me later in that moment. And now as I think to the next few years, you know, my why is I want to be able to not work forever. I want to be able to maybe dial back work. I'm 43 by 50. I don't want to be working as much. I'd like to maybe, you know, at that point, spend more time with my kids at as they are approaching college and we're about to empty nest. So I'm thinking about who I want to be in the future and how I can start to save and invest and earn today to meet that goal. And that's my anchoring why. And I, I think it's a pretty powerful one. Yes, I love that. A lot of my students, I am driven by money. I, I don't know why it is or what about me, but like I like the challenge of earning money and figuring that out. But a lot of my students are not driven by money. And so to get really clear on what they want and why they're doing what they're doing is so incredibly important because it does unlock their earning potential when they get clear in that area and what the money can do for them in terms of their values and their beliefs and their wants and needs. So I love that you said, get really clear on why you're doing this. And that really translates to a lot of the entrepreneurs that are listening. And yes, and I know that sometimes as women too, we have not been encouraged to want for money. Yes, so true. And so when we say something like, I want to be rich or I want to make more money out loud, <laughs> we can fear that because, um, well, there might be some rejection or side eye or any, you know, and, and, and I've faced all of it. And I want to, I guess my one message is that, well, there will always be naysayers and there were all, there will always be people who will doubt your potential or that you even should be the person who should go after the money. But for every one of those people, there's hundreds, thousands more who are watching and who will be inspired by you and who will follow in your footsteps. 
Like, Amy, how many people have you influenced? Thousands upon thousands. And had you stopped because a few people were upset or or skeptical of your ambitions, you're going to work for them and not for all of these people who are watching and will then be able to follow in your footsteps because they're seeing this modeled for them. And I'm sure that's a story that you can resonate with. There was probably someone you watched and were inspired by, and it could have been a man or a woman. But the point being is that sometimes we forget that people are watching. Hey. And that's a really that's a really great and privileged thing. And even if it's just three people, or even if it's just one person, you know, even if it's just your former self. I have a picture of my little self, five, six years old, on my desk. And not just because I was cute, but because it is a reminder to me that when I feel this is hard, I can't do it. I don't know how it's going to be perceived. People are going to reject me, blah, 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 blah. Well, what about that little girl who had all these hopes and dreams at a time when maybe the world was a little bit more <laughs> idyllic, but do it for her. Yeah. If no one else, do it for your for your younger self who did have all these visions and maybe was thinking and, and dreaming at a time when they didn't have <laughs> grasped the reality of the world. Yes. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I think that that's for me has been a very powerful visualizing tool. Mm, I think that's so great. Do it for her. That's that's really powerful. I love that. And one last thing I'll say before I ask you my next question that I want to get into is that I love that you said that you can inspire other people by sharing your money story. And when I talk about my money journey throughout building this business of 14 years and I share about my first million dollar launch and now having a multi-million dollar business, I get lots of feedback that people say, that gave me permission to go after it as well. Like if you mm -hmm. can do it, so can I. And I've had friends who said like, I didn't even know a million dollar launch was possible. And then you said it, and then I was able to do it. So those that are listening, especially women, I'm going to encourage all of you, talk about money more, more publicly on your podcast, in your blog, the good, bad, and ugly, because I do believe it unlocks something for other people to say, wait a second, what's possible for me? We have to see it in other people that we trust. So I love that you encourage that as well. I mean, I'm a living example of that. Yes. I followed women to, to where I am today. I would not be here had it not been for the silent modeling. These women didn't know I was watching them. Right. And taking notes. So true. And I have some peers that never say anything about money and they're very successful. And I feel as though they're doing a disservice because if they would share how they did it or what it looks like on the other side, it would allow so many other women to unlock that as well. So- I'm just a really big proponent of let's talk about it more. Mm -hmm. Now, but when you do talk about it, like I said, you got to share the good, bad, and ugly because there are some unhealthy narratives around money that may have been instilled in us in our early years. And I know for me, definitely, my dad raised me to believe that if you are not working hard, which means breaking your back, killing yourself, working extra hours. My dad was a firefighter, but he had another job because, and we never saw him. But in his eyes, that meant he was working hard and providing for his family. So I grew up believing you can't have money unless you practically kill yourself to get it. <laughs> and so that's something I've been working on for 14 years. So for me to say, I'm going to go down to three days a week, let's see if I do it. But that is a lot of growth right there. Yeah. So my question to you is how do we break free from these unhealthy narratives that are very much ingrained in us since youth. Well, to, to use the example of your father, that was not a healthy lifestyle. No. And I don't know what the how that manifested in his personal health and his physical health, but I can only imagine the stress. And again, we talked about this earlier, like your health is an important financial asset to some extent, right? It's an important resource. And so when you are sacrificing very important assets in your life in the pursuit of money, that's when you have to start realizing like the math here is not mathing. <laughs> and I think that ultimately the true definition of wealth is being able to call your own shots. And if you want to work all day, every day, that is what you call calling your own shots. I, I don't think anybody would say that, but you know, if you start looking at your life through that lens, I think you start to see some of the 
the silliness in the hustle and the overworking that is leading to burnout, that is leading to you not ultimately being able to enjoy your money. Absolutely. Here's my offer. I mean, you're working so hard for what? Um, and I know that for some people it's, well, I'm working so hard to provide for my family and give. And yes, that's important. But what are you giving to yourself? Yes. I completely understand that mindset. I think some other toxic financial mindsets that we have is like, my self-worth is my net worth. So we've sort of touched on this, but if I make less this year, yeah. Or if I make less in my partnership than my partner, I'm, I have less of a voice. I should have less of a voice in decisions relating to money and other big things. I've also heard people talk about growing up with this mentality that if you are rich or you have more, then you're smarter than everybody else. Oh, that, that hurts. Yeah. Because listen, you and I, everybody listening, we've all benefited from some luck in our lives. Just me being born in this country and not in Iran, uh, which could have easily happened, but it was sort of like this sort of serendipitous thing, that has probably accounted for 50, 60% of the fact that I could like be here talking to you, having this book, having this business, because, well, maybe 100%, because I wouldn't be able to do any of that in a totalitarian regime. So I think recognizing the role of luck in your life and also both of the ways that it can work, there's good luck and bad luck, I think is an important thing that we're not talking about enough. And actually now that I've, I'm on this book tour and I'm talking a lot about financial wellness, I, I think that the word luck is another four letter word. And we don't wanna admit to sometimes having that stroke of luck in our lives because we think that maybe it means we're not as worthy of an opportunity so often I hear from people, I read about it in the news, someone makes you know overnight success literally because their company IPO'd and they were employee number eight and they made like $9 million and the grossness that they feel over this sudden wealth and wanting to detach from it because they feel like they don't deserve it because it's too much luck. It's too much, you know, and they should give it away. I think there's so much to unpack there, but I think that luck is a very triggering thing and we don't talk about it enough because we all have different sort of relationships with how we perceive luck. But all this to say that if you're somebody who thinks that becoming richer requires a higher level of intelligence, <laughs> yeah, I, I would say nope. I mean, look at the, some of the people who've gone on to be very, very successful who didn't even graduate from college. Exactly. Yes. Or high school. For sure. So I love this conversation and it doesn't have to end here because like we had mentioned, you have a brand new book out. It's called A Healthy State of Panic. So I want you to tell everyone just briefly, what is this book about and who's a good fit for this book? If someone's listening, how do they know that this is a book they need to go pick up? A Healthy State of Panic is about how to use fear as a tool, a constructive tool to help you get further along in life at life's biggest crossroads, dealing with your finances, your career, your relationships. If you are somebody who, like me, has tried to be fearless and it's just not working, fear is sort of a, a constant in your life. And you want to learn how to have a relationship with fear, a healthy one, so that you can go out there and, and achieve some stuff. This book is for you. I think it's for anybody who's at a crossroads again in their lives who wants to learn how to have a more intelligent, emotionally intelligent relationship with fear and through that process, learn a lot more about who they are, what they care about, what they want to protect. And from that vantage point, go and do the things that they want to do to feel like they're really winning at life. Mm -hmm. I love it. Okay. So where did they go to find the book and where did they go to learn more about you? You can learn more about the book at ahealthystateofpanic.com. You can learn more about me at farnoosh.tarabi.com. And again, I have a podcast called So Money, three days a week. And Amy, you have graced the show. Thank you. Uh, so everybody should start with that episode. And that's available at somoneypodcast.com or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Great podcast for sure. I'm going to put everything in the show notes so you all can get all the links. This is definitely an uh, action-packed episode with lots of goodies for you to take away from. So I want you all to start thinking about that one big takeaway that you're going to take action on. One might be just to grab the book. So Farnoosh, thank you so much for being here with us today. I truly appreciate it. Thank you, Amy. Take care. So there you have it. 
I truly don't get sick of having financial experts on the show. I think it's a topic we need to come back to again and again. My biggest takeaway from this episode was when Farnoosh was talking about fear, and that's what she talks a lot about in her book. It's not just about your finances. It's about so much more. We've all heard that we need to dance with fear. I know that's not new information. However, how often do we let fear around money hold us back from taking risks, going after what we want, and really experimenting with ideas that we have? If you're fearful that you don't have enough money or money will be taken away from you, it's something that really could stunt your growth. I've never shared this before, and I don't know why I'm sharing it now at the very end of this episode, um, but I'm going to tell you anyway. When I was getting out of my partnership many, many years ago, and you all know I have an entire chapter of the brutal experience I went through of getting out of a partnership, but when I went to my partner and said, I want out, the first thing he said to me was, this is not going to be good for you because of how you view money. And... I actually never asked him what he meant by that, but I made my own assumptions. And back then, I did hold on to money really tight. Like I believed that there wasn't more where that came from kind of situation. And I was really careful to the point that it was hard to expand the business because I didn't want to spend and I was afraid that there wasn't enough of it. And when he said that, I was so mad at him. I felt like he was such a jerk. But at the end of the day, that quote kept going over and over and over in my head. And I realized, wait, I do have some roadblocks here. I do white knuckle money. I do hold on to it tight. And I need to be more expansive and believe in abundance and worry less. And so it was actually a gift he gave me at the time. I did not like it. But that was like another one of my obstacles that I've had to work through over the years around money. And so we all have our own issues, right, around debt and money and how to make it and what is enough. But I really do believe if we keep talking about it and sharing our stories and reading books like Farnoosh's book, I really do believe it makes a huge difference. I want you to feel expansive in your money. I want you to feel as though there are so many opportunities to make money. I want you to feel intelligent around how you spend your money, how you make your money, how you just look at your money. I want you to feel confident. And that means we have to educate ourselves and we have to have the hard conversations. And I feel like today was a great step in that right direction. So I hope you love this episode. And if you know somebody else who is struggling in this area or wants to build their wealth and they're just getting started, please share this episode with them. I would greatly appreciate it. I think it could make a difference. All right, my sweet friends, I'll see you again this week. And I cannot wait to share more value with you as you build your business and you build that freedom-filled life. All right, talk to you soon. Take care.